Honourable Member for Brandon Suris. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'll be splitting my time with the uh, member from Banff Airdrie. The easiest thing for a government to do is to spend money. Why? Well, because it's not their money. When a cabinet minister shows up in a community with a speech and an announcement, it's not that they are donating the money out of their own pocket. It's that they have made a political decision to spend taxpayers' money on a particular expenditure. There's nothing nefarious about this practice except in the case where the government of the day starts spending money it doesn't have, and they have no rationale on why they are downloading that debt onto the next generation. If we're looking for reasons why spending is out of control, I suggest we look at how they waste taxpayers' money on such outrageous items as a giant rubber duck, a temporary skating rink, or on an international trip that had very foggy expected outcomes. I've always said that when you watch the pennies, the dollars will take care of themselves. Politicians need to be reminded on a constant basis that money doesn't grow on trees. It doesn't magically appear out of thin air, and budgets don't balance themselves. The budget has increased spending by 20 per cent in its first three years, and there is no evidence that it created any growth in the Canadian economy. Just 2 per cent of additional spending over the five years up to 2020 is on genuine efficiency-enhancing infrastructure that would increase productivity. I know the very phrase, fiscal responsibility, doesn't exactly roll off the tongue or elicit great emotional responses, but I believe it should be the mantra of every Member of Parliament. The money that any level of government spends comes from taxing the people who create it through their own blood, sweat and tears. People do not willingly give their money to the government either. We actually have to pass legislation that mandates it. To put a face on these individuals who provide the government with its funding, we can just walk across the street and look at the individuals working at, say, the Tim Hortons, the shoe shop, the Hallmark store and the local pub. They literally are in the very shadow of the parliament buildings as they are across Canada. Now, when a government isn't collecting enough taxes for its planned spending, it just goes out and borrows it. Or, in the Liberals' case, they raise taxes and go out and borrow it. We don't need to go far to see an example of this sort of behaviour. It's in the budget we are debating here today. And make no mistake, governments need to collect taxes to pay for the society we want to create. Those tax dollars for our roads, highways, schools and hospitals. They pay for those. My argument is not that a government shouldn't have the resources to carry out the fiduciary, fiduciary duty of its citizens. It's that the Liberal government has no sense of purpose in running massive deficits. The country is not in a recession. There are no real economic arguments to be spending more than they are bringing in. And worst of all, there is no end in sight. This is a dilemma in which Canadians find themselves. Of course, every government is going to receive way more asks for funding than they could possibly be able to implement. The thorn in every taxpayer's side is this Liberal government's priorities are questionable, and that's being generous with what some of the other phrases could be that are used. Case in point is when convicted terrorists are getting millions of dollar settlements and the Prime Minister has the gall to tell a veteran that he's asking for more than we can provide. Or that Canada will be sending millions of dollars overseas to build infrastructure, and yes, even possibly pipelines in Asia. That's why Canadians are rapidly losing faith in this government. And I'm sure it's causing great consultation across the way when they read that Stephen Harper had higher approval ratings at this point in office than the current Prime Minister. The Liberals have money and time for everyone else except for the real challenges we face at home. Now, instead of doing fake consultations or preordained budget requests, I did something that elected representatives should do. Listen to the people they represent. In the middle of some of the coldest days in January, I held six public town halls across my constituency. I made sure that everyone and anyone was welcome to come share their priorities on what they wanted to be included in the budget 2018. Over the span of three days, we loaded up projector and screen. We traveled hundreds of kilometers to reach people in surrounding areas of Brandon, Verdon, Melita, Pilot Mound, Glenborough, and Surus. I represent the southwestern part of Manitoba, Madam Speaker. It is a constituency made up of over 30 communities and where our economy is rooted in agriculture, natural resources, and the service industry. 
we have very unique challenges facing the communities compared to a more urban riding. It was in those town halls that I drew my idea for my budget letter that I sent to the Prime Minister to the Minister of Finance. Pardon me. There was a constant drumbeat of concern on the overall direction and priorities of this government. There was a sense of disbelief that the government had thrown out the idea of returning to a balanced budget. There were concerns on how much of their tax money is being spent on just paying the interest on the new debt the Liberals are racking up. And it bears repeating that the Liberals immediately broke their promise on running modest deficits. Over three years in power, this Liberal government has piled on $60 billion to the national debt. The deficit is $18.1 billion this year, three times their own original projections. That's a staggering number. Just this past week, the PBO released a report that said they are also refusing to release the necessary information to account for its borrowing and spending plan. If the PBO can't get the necessary information to produce his reports, then that is, a ve is very telling as to how MPs in this House must feel regarding how they can have a meaningful debate on the numbers contained in the budget. But what we do know is that according to projections from finance, the budget will not return to balance until 2045, by then racking up an additional $450 billion of debt. When the economy is growing at 3 percent, a responsible government would pay down debt so that we have more fiscal room to deploy in case there is a downturn. In 2008, the Conservative government was able to take decisive action to support the Canadian economy during a true recession. What makes this deficit hard to swallow is that the government has done a terrible job of explaining where the money is going. When I look across my constituency, there are no massive new projects to explain how this money is being spent. Even the PBO said the government is failing to account for, the new, for new infrastructure spending. But what I do hear from my constituents is how the government's policies are eroding their disposable income. There is very little in this budget that will immediately provide any form of tangible tax relief and improve anyone's quality of life. All this budget does is remind us of previously ill-thought-out Liberal decisions, like hiking Canada Pension Plan premiums on employees and employers, or hiking employment insurance premiums that will hurt small business owners and do nothing to create a better economic environment that will create private sector jobs. What I was looking for in Budget 2018 was a plan that actually improved the economic position of not only the constituents I represent, but for the country as a whole. I was looking for timely and meaningful tax relief for those who need it. The mere fact that their middle tax cut doesn't provide a nickel, middle income, pardon me, uh, Madam uh, Speaker, the mere fact that their middle income tax cut doesn't provide a nickel of relief to those making less than $44,000 is indicative of the priorities of this government. I was looking for ways the government would immediately improve the quality of life for seniors and students in my constituency, such as my ideas to immediately prioritize seniors' co-op housing and make it easier for students to get loans. In closing, Madam Speaker, the government's budget falls short of providing solutions to many of the challenges my constituents are facing. It does not set Canada on the right course, nor has it any substance that would justify their tax and spend ways. I would ask the government members opposite to listen to our ideas and concerns. They need to go back to the drawing board and return with a budget that contains some form of reasoning for breaking their promise of running even modest deficits. Questions and comments? Uh, questions et commentaires? The Honourable uh, Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister of Pardon me? <laughs> for the Minister of Public Safety. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I, I, I listened to the comments uh, of my colleague opposite. I appreciate his uh, his thoughts on the budget. Uh, but a couple of points of concern. Um, the first, is I would ask him to to reconcile his comments on the deficit with the fact that the uh, previous Conservative government, the previous Harper government, 
uh, ran a total of $150 billion uh, in, in debt uh, over the period that they were there, completely erasing the, def, uh, the debt uh, that was paid down during the Martin era. Uh, and that they had run the largest deficit in Canadian history. They ran deficits six years in a row, uh, and during that same period of time had uh, absolutely anemic growth, the worst growth that the country had seen in a generation, uh, running at near zero percent, uh, at the back of the pack of the G7. Uh, and he contrasts that with where we are today, where we had campaigned on utilizing deficits to drive growth and job creation and wealth for the middle class, where we have now moved to the top of the pack of the, G, uh, of the G8 nations in terms of job creation and in terms of growth, where we have left behind that period of anemic dead growth and are now driving forward with an economy that's working, creating more than 600,000 jobs. Uh, how can he reconcile his comments, his, his, his comments against a deficit when his party, uh, frankly, reigned supreme in the creation of deficits in their tenure on this side of the House? A member for Brandon Suris. Well, thank you uh, for the, my colleague for that question, and Madam Speaker. Uh, that's probably the question that if I had to write one that I would want to answer, I would write it and give it to them. Mr. Sp Madam Speaker, the government, th this, th my honourable colleague across the way, has failed to realise that, as I said in my speech, we governed in a true recession, and we had a plan, and Stephen Harper did return the country to a balanced budget in six years instead of seven, which was his plan to do. They were left with a surplus. They say they've created 600,000 jobs. We created 1.2 million full-time jobs in the middle of the worst recession we've seen since at least the 30s, if not even more than that, Mr. Speaker. We left them with the best GDP ratio of the G7. We left them with a balanced mm -hmm. budget. And, Madam Speaker, it's the height of hypocrisy. And I, and I know we, there were deficits run, but there was $150 billion, as he pointed out, spent and invested in Canadian jobs by the Harper government during that recession. But the point of my speech, Madam Speaker, was there is no recession now. There was no plan by the Liberal government to do what they're doing today. And there was under the Conservative government, and we returned to balanced budgets and left Canada in very strong position, and the Liberals have wasted it. Here, here. Questions and comments? Uh, questions and commentaires? The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for his good. comments. Uh, we actually um, sit on the uh, immigration and Citizenship Refugee Committee together, and we learned this week at committee uh, from the government officials that, in fact, the uh, IRB, while they got some money from this budget, uh, it is not nearly sufficient to deal with the increase in cases. Currently, there are 40,000 cases uh, in the backlog. The amount of dollars from this budget will only process about 18,000 cases. It's not even half of the cases that are in the backlog. And at a time where we are seeing the new applications coming in at the rate of 2,100 cases per month, I wonder what the uh, members' thoughts are around that with respect to this urgent issue for the IRB. If we don't ensure that the IRB is functioning well and is Source to do its work that it puts at risk our entire uh, the integrity of our entire immigration system. So I'd like the member to comment on that, please. The member has uh, one minute to respond. The honourable member for Brandon Sirs. I do want to thank my honourable colleague from British Columbia for the question, and I have enjoyed the work immensely sitting on the immigration committee with her. Uh, this is a, an area of great concern for all of us in Canada as we see no greater numbers of need of uh, refugees coming into our country and of immigrants coming in for sure. And for the government to, uh, as I say, uh, as I said in my speech, they just don't seem to get the prioritization of dealing with the dollars that they have in the budget at their disposal. They continue to say that they've got lots of money for infrastructure, lots of money for immigration. But where is it, Madam Speaker? It must be hidden someplace because they continue to uh, shirk their responsibilities in getting infrastructure development going, and they continue to leave a shortfall in regards to the requirements of our immigration process, even though in opposition, uh, both she and I have had the opportunity of putting forward ideas in recommendations in reports that have been done by the Immigration Committee that the government hasn't acted on yet that would improve the situation. Thank you.